everyone uh, in this room realizes that we, have, we, are at a, we are at a place in biomedical research and clinical care and in health um, uh, where we've reached levels of understanding, not only within disciplines, but across them, uh, that uh, provide an opportunity to um, uh, move forward uh, in, in remarkable ways. Uh, I think what's interesting about that in the context of this meeting is that that uh, element of remarkable progress um, uh, it has at least the potential to come into confluence with uh, interest in Washington in um, uh, interrogating uh, processes and policies uh, that uh, govern the way that we do our work, that fund the way that we do our work, um, that are going to be uh, really essential conversations if the work itself is to, be, is, is to really be put into application and uh, have an impact in the way that the potential says that it could. Um, and, and so that's an interesting uh, confluence, not one that we've had, you know, I would venture, uh, in, the re in the recent past, maybe in the past. Um, and it's uh, particularly exciting that, it come, that that interest comes from two uh, branches of government. Uh, you are all aware that um, on January 30th, President Obama uh, uh, rolled out the President's Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, a concept that was uh, developed, grew from uh, a National Research Council report that published in, at the end of 2011 uh, that uh, suggested that if we were to find a way to uh, aggregate, uh, uh, integrate, and analyze uh, all, essentially all biological information, not just about people, but about experimental systems and so forth, that we could move toward, uh, in fact, the report was called Toward Precision Medicine, um, that we could move toward um, uh, precise diagnosis and therapeutic decisions and, and treatments and cures uh, in ways that we've just never been able to do before. We can, we can move away from uh, treating statistical groups and move toward treating individuals. And at the same time, the legislative branch, Congress, has um, uh, developed uh, uh, interests of its own, asking, are there, is there legislative language that could be crafted that would also help to move this endeavor forward? Um, and and uh, so it's really that confluence of the interest in the, the uh, part of uh, the government uh, with what's happened in scientific and medical research, uh, I think that um, brings this, has pulled this meeting together um, and, and, uh, and, and uh, enables us to, to, to debate, uh, define and debate uh, issues, uh, see opportunities, define the challenges, find the barriers, um, and see if we can find our way through them. So that's really going to be what this uh, meeting is about. The meeting uh, came about um, um, uh, through the, an invitation uh, from the Manhattan Institute, uh, Paul Howard is sitting right here and I'm going to introduce in a moment to say a few words, um, um, uh, uh, who, to organize a set of meetings around the country. And they did this, they are doing this, because um, uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee, the, Inter the Committee in the House of Representatives, uh, chaired by Fred Upton, um, uh, uh, really sought to get um, input and feedback and suggestions and advice and criticisms uh, from around the country, not just within the Beltway. That's uh, unusual in itself. Um, and the Manhattan Institute's taken on uh, the, the, the challenge to collect that information as the legislation is being drafted. So, um, uh, so the, the, uh, the committee has at least enunciated a desire to really use this information and feedback uh, from around the country uh, to inform the way that that legislation uh, is crafted, both, both the topical foci and what the, what the language really says. Uh, so that's a great opportunity. So it's a chance for uh, uh, the, those of us who are uh, researchers or clinicians uh, in the room uh, uh, that are kind of on the ground with uh, the work that's being done and kind of see or sense the opportunities in front of us um, to really have some input in the way that, that uh, this, these pieces are put together. Uh, the President's initiative similarly is 
being crafted um, in a way that's going to be collecting input. Some of you are familiar with the Brain Initiative. As it rolled out, know that there were meetings similarly held around the country to get input from scientists, and that same thing's going to happen with precision medicine. So um, uh, uh, as a consequence, we've, we've uh, we, uh, accepted the invitation from the Manhattan Institute at UCSF to pull together this meeting. Um, most of the people who are here from UCSF know that precision medicine is itself the uh, kind of primary organizing principle by which our efforts are moving forward here. Um, uh, so we, we're very deeply involved in it. Um, and and uh, so it's, it's particularly topical for for uh, uh, us to be involved in, and uh, makes it particularly uh, makes us particularly happy to be able to welcome you all here to UCSF. Sorry about the terrible weather out there. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are coming from Boston, especially, um, uh, and uh, so welcome to San Francisco in that in that sense as well. Um, let me just say one word about the, the structure of the meeting, um, uh, and that is that you all have the agenda, you all have the bios of the people who are speaking, and so the introductions will be very brief in that context. Uh, there will be a session of short talks, uh, followed by clarifying questions if there are any, brief, uh, and, then, and then hopefully a period of open discussion. And then we'll move to a panel uh, that will be moderated, uh, and we'll talk about that and the panelists when the time comes for that session. Then there'll be sort of a time to schmooze and eat and drink and, and a net network, um, uh, followed by a, uh, a kind of policy roundtable or workshop uh, that will uh, begin to think about what we've heard today um, in, and really in that context of asking, what have we heard that could actually uh, uh, be beneficial in advising the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, the 21st Century Cures Committee in particular, uh, in ways that could be uh, informative and move us toward policy that would really help us. Um, uh, and so I think it's going to be an exciting uh, a day. Hope that, you, hope that you really enjoy it. Let me turn the microphone over to Paul Howard, uh, from, uh, who's a director and senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, uh, the outfit that generated uh, the, uh, the invitation for this meeting and is also organizing others around the country to collect the kind of input from the from the community. Well. Thank you very much, Keith. And I'd like to particularly thank Keith and his excellent staff, uh, Jenny Banizek and India Hook Bernard, for putting together a wonderful program. Um, I know that some of you, when uh, policymakers or Congress starts paying attention to what you're doing, you might wince. You might wonder what's going to happen. Um, but I think that there's a wonderful confluence. Uh, of interest, as Keith pointed out, at the White House and in Congress around one subject, and one subject alone, and that is improving outcomes for patients. That's what brings us together. That's what brings Congress together. That's what brings the President's Initiative together. The realization with the technology and tools that are online today, or that will be coming online shortly, that we have an obligation to learn how to maximize those tools and deploy them in a way so that, as much as possible, every patient in the U.S. can benefit um, from uh, advances in precision medicine. So you have uh, right now uh, the President's Precision Medicine Initiative. You have a nearly 400-page uh, long bill uh, in the House from Energy and Commerce. But what uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, uh, in a bipartisan effort, has made clear is that's a draft. They are looking for feedback. They want feedback. If there is something wrong with what they presented, they'd like to hear that. Uh, if there's something missing, they'd like to know that, too. But I, I completely agree with Keith that this is an opportunity perhaps once in a generation when the stars align and the, the voice of the scientific community, the medical research community, the patient community can align to deploy uh, the resources uh, of the federal government, of private industry in a way that are really going to dramatically improve outcomes for patients in the next 10 to 15 years. And that should be the lodestar of all of our efforts as we move forward in this space. Thank you. So, so, um uh, yeah, I was just going to actually ask Paul if he wanted to thank people from his staff. I really wanted to, to end, close this uh, introduction by uh, reckon, you all recognize these things don't just happen by themselves. Um, and, and it's really been through the efforts of two people of my staff, uh, Jenny Banizak and Deanna Talavera. Are you both back there? Jenny's standing right in the very back. Um, and Deanna Talavera, who have uh, really done the logistical organization of this. I'm going to introduce India Hook Barnard in a minute, um, uh, who's going to really oversee the first session. 
um, and those people from the UCSF side that have really been instrumental in, in making it work. And I don't know if you wanted to mention anybody from, from uh, your staff that has been Not doing this as well. Yeah. Today has been uh, instrumental as well as uh, Debbie Azard and um, uh, Kate Lukeman have all helped us put this together. It's been a, a big moving target, but it's come together wonderfully. Yeah, so let's uh, give them, let's start with a round of applause for them. We really appreciate it. All right, great. Thanks for having me here. It's, uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be able to join UCSF. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks for having me uh, give a couple minutes of thoughts. So I'm the director of this uh, Institute for Computational Health Sciences. In just about one minute, uh, we're going to have to slum it out in that brand new building across the street while they build our brand new building by 2019. Uh, amazingly, yet ironically positioned right between Illumina and the new hospital. And the idea here is to recruit uh, about a dozen faculty over the next few years everything from the molecular side to uh, planet-wide populational scale and uh, dealing with data and trying to make a difference for health, so computational health. I'll tell you more about this at the end. So, but here we're talking about precision medicine, we're talking about new initiatives that we're thinking about. And uh, to me, I got my start uh, way back 15 years ago in this field, uh, dealing with uh, amazing gizmos like this. Uh, this is on the left, uh, just an example of a gene expression microarray from a company called Affymetrix down in Santa Clara, just a little bit down the road. And to me, this is still an amazing device. If you've never seen one, I always bring one as a prop. I have one in my hand here, and you can just see. It just looks cool. It looks like an Intel chip. And of course, they're right next door to Intel in Santa Clara. And uh, this to me is amazing. With one of these gadgets, we can measure the entire genome, right? Uh, from, to be, for the aficionados, it's the RNA. You can measure DNA, it's spelling differences. But on one chip, you get the whole genome, basically uh, the size of your thumbnail. And when you get tired of measuring them one by one, you get them 96 at a time with a 96 well plate. Any of you who spent time in a lab know what a 96 well plate is. And each well is at the bottom there. Now, as amazing as this is, we've had these already for 15 years. That's not the cool part. The cool part is because of strong policies. It started with the journals, then went to the funding agencies, now it's governmental policy. Because of strong policies, it's amazing. Scientists who use these and get funding to do this have to share this data with each other. So compared to the clinical world where it's tough to get scientists or clinicians to share data, the molecular side, the genomic side, it's amazing. It's not perfect, but it's amazing how many scientists have to share this data, actually do end up sharing this data into the public, into the open. And so fast forward from 15 years ago to August of 2012, we hit a million of these chips publicly available. One million. Actually today, if you look, we're at 1.7 million because 2012 was eons ago, right? Already another 700,000. Just in the couple hours here, we're going to add another 1,000 to the repository of these chips. Whatever cancer you want, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, whatever disease, it's probably been studied by some scientists at some point. And so to me, this is an amazing thing. And this is, to me, as we get more funding, directly or indirectly for research, I think it's going to be important for us to continually make sure that that $1 goes further that we're not in this just to write more papers, but actually to do something and make a difference here. And some of this collecting data that someone else is going to be able to act on. It might not be within our own academic labs, but someone else will act on that data, and we have to enable that to make sure it happens. Of course, one reason for that is because it's costing more and more to make a new drug. Uh, I show this one uh, uh, from the usual piece that people show from Forbes. I love this one. Uh, because it just shows pe most people think it costs a billion dollars in 10 years to make a drug. And if you do the simple math of just R&D dollars divided by the number of drugs, you can get numbers from $4 billion to $12 billion to make a drug. Kind of not sustainable anymore. At a certain point, uh, this gets to be too costly. And uh, if you still don't come up with enough drugs, then you ha it end up with a patent cliff where you, this actually leads to a disaster in terms of revenue expectations. I love this one because it's kind of funny. The middle one, Pfizer here, which I know and love, it's trying to buy this one, AstraZeneca, up here, right? I'm not a strategic consultant. If I were that expensive, I'd probably buy one lower on the list, not the one higher. But it all has to do with pipelines and things like that. Of course. I mean, so I, I understand this field. I know it's complicated. It's difficult to make these drugs. It's costly. But I felt like we have to start to make a difference in academia. So people know one of the stories that I've been trying to figure out is how to use existing drugs for new uses or drug repositioning. And the one I love the best is this one where we found uh, just about a year ago that uh, tricyclic antidepressant, imipramine, we still have this in the pharmacy. Tri imipramine seems like it melts lung cancer, small cell lung cancer in this mouse model. And why I love this one is because imipramine, we really don't use it. It has some minor side effects. Uh, you know, it makes you sleepy, might lead to an arrhythmia in some people. Well, neither of those two sound as bad as having lung cancer, which is 5% survival rate. 
And this one went from public data. We had a computational prediction. We got the cell lines to work. We get the mouse to work. And then we get ethics port, IRB approval in 15 months. Right? I'm not talking 10 years. 15 months, we launch a clinical trial. Total cost of clinical trial, $50,000. Not even a million dollars. $50,000. I don't even know if this is going to work or not. It kind of doesn't even matter. We've got to have newer ways, the Silicon Valley type of tradition. We're not going to keep doing things the old way. And that's the kind of point here. And that's what I see around me here at UCSF, which is why I'm excited to move here. Now, in that spirit, we also have to recognize another point, that we're not going to do everything in academia, regardless of that same increase in NIH funding that we all want, that it seems to even be bipartisan. We're going to have to do this in industry as well. And to me, the new academic is the academic that also starts companies because the science has to continue in a company. That's just the reality. I always show my wife who helped start a company called Numedi to just take new uses for drugs out. I'm not showing you a $3.5 million uh, Series A to brag about it. I'm just trying to point out, do you know how hard, how hard it is to get a $3.5 million NIH grant today? It's kind of next to impossible. Science can continue in a startup company. Faculty should be there to make sure that that happens. And this is how we're going to scale ideas and discoveries out of our lab, whether it's on therapeutics or also diagnostics, that we can get diagnostics discovered, get the papers out, the same academic currency, and then move them out of lab because we have to get this back closer to patients. As an academic, I continually teach my graduate students, if you want to change the world, you can't just keep writing papers about it. You got to actually move these things out of lab as well. And just to close out, the data is just enormous and immense. If you love genetics data, dbGaP is a repository run by NIH where you got thousands, you can't even see the font here, it's so tiny, just thousands of genetic studies, so each of which looking for hundreds to thousands of individuals with DNA already available. You can't just download this off the internet, you gotta get permissions, you gotta agree to keep the stuff secure. But I've just circled at the top here the entire Framingham Heart Study, the reason why we know the word cholesterol in the United States. Well, you can now download 14,000 patients' genotypes, as well as 30 years of measurements on these people. What an amazing area to discover something new, biomarkers, maybe some disease subsets, and that's just one of thousands here. The Cancer Genome Atlas, of course, many people know 11,000 samples from 20 different types of cancers. You know, we can always pick on these data sets and keep saying they're not perfect, they're not perfect, but boy, they're really good, and don't let perfection get in the way of a really good job here. And PubChem is my favorite, where we just have so much chemical screening data. Chemical screening is robotics, testing all of these thousands of chemicals to see if they have an effect. Well, if NIH funded you to do it, you got to deposit your data into PubChem. So now you got 170 million drugs and future drugs as the columns. 1.1 million researchers have already done an assay, a bioassay. If you do that math, you've got almost 200 trillion little boxes where someone's done a measurement of this drug and this assay. I can easily bet you a beer this beats any pharmaceutical companies. Drugs. I can easily bet you a bottle of wine, this beats all pharmaceutical companies combined. Because this is still doubling every three years. And very little in the pharma world is going to be doubling every three years anymore. And they, we, they give this away without a user ID and password today. And it's just sitting there waiting for more people trained to make better use of this data. And in some ways, that's going to be the really the center of excellence for academia here, so train more people in precision medicine, because boy, we have a lot of data out there. We have a lot of unmet need. We need more people acting in this field. It's also financial data that's going to be public. Boy, we better get a handle on the financial data in academia before the reporters do and write embarrassing stories like this on how, my, how our neighbors can charge less than us. And I'm just going to end with one point. What am I spending half of my lab on now is population level data, and specifically clinical trials. I think we're going to get to more clinical trials as legislation moves out. What is a clinical trial? It's the most expensive experiment in the world. It's why it's costing billions. And half of them fail. And we have this weird culture when the experiment fails, we don't even write papers about it when they fail. Never mind, let the data out. Well, it's going to have to change. The Europeans are starting to figure out how to get more uh, arms twisted to release raw data. I think the FDA might someday. We'll see. Uh, but I think I'm already seeing where the hockey puck is going. I'm going to train my lab to figure out how to put data sets together in the clinical trial space because I think that's going to be the next level, moving up from molecular to these amazing experimental data sets. Finally, I want to close out with one point. We uh, just recently, Hannah and my lab, uh, who's moving as well as 20 other people next week, put together just a nice kind of map of just, I asked her, well, can you just tell me in one slide, why do people die in California? Because let's just talk about the biggest population that I'm going to be probably responsible for. Why do people die in California? Well, she went out, got a couple of data sets. Here's one called the Healthcare Utilization uh, Policy Database, where from the CDC and different uh, governmental subsets where she just basically, every circle here is an illustrator of just diagnosis code. So a lot of people get sepsis, a lot of people get heart attacks, and the arrows just tell you within one year how likely is it to go from one circle to another. All the boxes mean you died of something. That was on your death certificate. 
and you get to see how people go from map to map. One of the neatest things about my new job next week is not only am I at UCSF, one of the most amazing campuses in the world, but they gave me this position, something called UC Health. UC Health is not just UCSF, but the four other University of California medical schools. There's four others, Riverside, Davis, San Diego, LA, and San Francisco. I've memorized that list. So we've got five UC medical schools, and my job somehow is to make sure that we get a future de-identified, safe, common electronic data warehouse across all 14 million patients seen at a UC hospital. It's about 4% of the US population seen at a University of California hospital. Someday, we're talking about knowledge networks, I'm gonna plot all 14 million people on a map like this and know what to fix tomorrow to make sure that we're reducing mortality and morbidity. And to me, this could be a knowledge map and we can work on others. Lots of data also out there, electronic health record data, and just keeps coming. So in the end, how do I put this all together in my own thinking? I think about patients, and remember, what is precision medicine? To me, it goes all the way back to something really good old-fashioned. We want to have, make sure every person has a good outcome in the end. Now, here's my one patient with a good outcome, heading towards a good outcome. And oh boy, you know what? Oops, this one's about to head towards a poor outcome. And you know, in medicine, we only get to see them once in a while, an exam room or an emergency room or an operating room. And those are our biomedical moments. They might be getting closer together with mobile devices and wearables, but we don't, we don't live with our patients, right? We only get to see them once in a while. Here's a moment where this patient's about to head towards a poor outcome. The whole world, UCSF and others, are trying to figure out what in the genetics and genomics is altering that outcome. But it's very important for us to realize that we can have a genome sequence on every individual, but if they can't afford the meds, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, what's the point if they can't afford the transplant meds or they live in a field next to pesticides? We've got to get the social and environmental side too. And you want to if they can afford the meds and we've got a genome on everyone, if we don't practice good quality care, it's all for naught again anyway. And so the point is quality care, social environment, uh, genetics and genomics, all of this play a role in data-driven precision medicine. It's not just about the molecule, it's about the context of the individual as well, and the context of that patient. We should be learning from everyone in real time, and that is a learning healthcare system. And so with that, I'll bring it to an end. Well, I've got a lot of slides and I'm gonna get through them quickly, so hope you're all heavily caffeinated. Um, all right, so I wanna start off by saying that I'm gonna show you a lot of challenges up front. I'm gonna show you some of the work that we've undertaken with UCSF to start solving those challenges. Um, there's a lot in here, and there has been some heroic work uh, put in at UCSF by uh, some people who are here today. So Michael Korn is here, and he's done uh, uh, the, the Lord's work of getting the oncologists together and really getting everyone on board uh, with this. And of course, Kristen McCaleb, who's here, who's uh, whipped everyone into shape as well um, at UCSF uh, on the program management side. And of course, Keith, uh, without whom uh, none of this would be possible. And Bob Nussbaum is unfortunately not here with us today. He's uh, at a conference in Salt Lake City, but incredible work. So. We have a major, major challenge in healthcare, delivering genomic and other rich molecular data in the context of today's health information technology systems. So let's just assume we could interpret genomic information. You couldn't even effectively deliver it to a clinician today. And the reason why is that you have all these legacy systems that are straight out of the 1980s that are all a bunch of silos and don't talk to each other. And the worst offender is Unfortunately, the electronic medical record system. I didn't make this screenshot up. That's, uh, you can read the name of a vendor on there. Um, that's from their website, folks. So you have these systems that are not built to be data systems. You have systems that are built for billing and compliance purposes that are being repurposed to try to support clinical workflows and data. So we all know that they're not very good at that stuff. And for those of you who don't practice and who aren't using the EMR every day, this is what it looks like. You go in, you have a bunch of encounter records in the system. A patient might have hundreds or thousands of these records as they come in. You sometimes have structured information. This is data that's actually structured on the page. You can't really read it, but height, weight, you know, temperature, things like that. Great, we have structured information. Then you get into your pathology report which begins, and in oncology, you begin to get into the data that you really care about, and these are semi-structured. Um, so you've got 
you know, things like, you know, the specific um, markers or genetic variants, and they're kind of structured, but not really. And then, of course, you just get all the free text uh, in the medical record, the physician notes, which are usually copied and pasted from one record to another, so you get these errors that propagate over time. Then you have misconfigurations in the medical record systems that'll happen. So as an example, this patient was put on a targeted therapy, but that targeted therapy is nowhere to be found on the medication tab for the patient in this specific record. And then the next thing is you have genomic information. And I play the game of find the genomics in the genomics part of the medical record. Well, here, here it is. You've got your non-UCSF lab result, an outside record, and an outside record. None of this is searchable, so you have no idea where any of this is. And then when you find the one that you want and you click into it, what is the process? Well, it's some lab that's generated a piece of paper, printed it out, faxed it from one department to another or one lab to another, and scanned it in not only as non-computable data, but as fuzzy, unreadable information. So this is kind of what we're dealing with today. Um, and this is what we have to overcome. So I took this from Bob. This was his Tower of Babel slide. I mean, this is basically where we're at, where we've got no standard data types, no standard schemas. You've got just a total disaster, um, unfortunately. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's really what we're dealing with. And then you have the fax machine, which refuses to die. <laughs> so you're keeping a lot of companies in business here. <laughs> um, so uh, what, what, we've, what we've done at UCSF is we've implemented our software. And again, you know, the problems aren't solved, but we've made some progress. So what we've done is integrated molecular data into the clinical workflow starting in oncology and hopefully expanding beyond there. There's decision support, and then this happens across the affiliate network. So what does this really mean? So if we look at oncology at UCSF, um, they're doing uh, tumor uh, genome profiling internally. Everything is clinical. This isn't a research exercise. This is a clinical care exercise. Um, paired tumor normal, because UCSF, thankfully, is not afraid of uh, germline result return to patients. So patients are consented for that. And they're looking at diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic implications. So they've really taken a you know, comprehensive approach where they're not afraid to address a lot of the problems. Um, there are so many challenges here, um, starting with you need to be able to place orders and return results in these legacy systems that don't understand the results that are coming back. And you need to be able to deal with the legacy system that doesn't get you know, what we're trying to do in genomics. So you have to figure out how to take these systems from the 1980s and rejigger them so they can actually understand the types of workflows that we want to do today. Um, you don't just have the EMR. The EMR isn't the be-all and end-all. You have all these other systems, like your PAC system and other radiology systems. You've got your pathology systems. So you've got all these different systems that you have to contend with, where you have to bring the information together. Of course, you have new clinical workflows. And you have uh, uh, groups like molecular tumor boards who are meeting and offering expert uh, consultative guidance. And typically, that guidance winds up in someone's head or maybe, if you're lucky, on a PowerPoint document. So you've got all these systematic problems that need to be addressed where software is only one element of it. So what we've been able to do so far at UCSF is go in and implement a system where some of it is software and some of it is actually behavior change. So with data integration, what we've managed to do is we've managed to either hack some of the current systems so that we're actually ingesting structured genomic information, or we've done some behavior change so that we move the institution to structured reporting of uh, genomic and molecular data. So we begin to database all the patient's information. We then get the information from the clinical realm, where again, it's not just the medical record, but it's also the imaging data from the radiology systems. It's also um, the pathology information. But most importantly, it's not just the drugs that have been ordered, but it's what the patient actually received. So just because something was ordered doesn't mean the patient showed up for their visit. And you need to be able to understand that you have to map in your administration to your orders. And all of that has been combined in one place. So now you can actually go in at UCSF and say, I want a metastatic melanoma patient who had a variant in this gene and who received this drug. And you can actually do that query here at UCSF, which is spectacular progress from where we collectively were a year ago. And then the other part of this is, is the workflow optimization, where there's been a workflow that has been put in place, clinical workflow, 
where tumors are sequenced as a policy, metastatic patients. They're put through a comprehensive workflow, and every stage of the workflow has software support, including the molecular tumor board, where molecular tumor board guidance are actually now being entered as structured, repeatably usable information into a software system. So you don't have this physician experiential um, uh, potential bias coming in place where you can actually database the recommendations and have them traceable over time. And all this is iterative, so as you're going through this process, you're learning. So there's a whole set of solutions that have been put in place to support this. Um, hacking the old systems like the EMR, um, being able to have new systems like a decision support application in place, being able to store knowledge, um, et cetera. Just to show you some screenshots of what it looks like, so patients are, are, patients are in the system, clinical history review, the oncologists would have access to this, so they could see encounters, tumor volume, treatments, reports in an easy dashboard. Uh, molecular report comes back, they get the therapeutic guidance and recommendations as determined by best practice and uh, therapy ordering. Molecular tumor board guidance, again, all structured and databased, and then similar patient insights where you can go and actually see the top therapies um, that have been given um, and what the response was. And this all relies on some complex integration that I know I'm running out of time, so I won't go into, um, but uh, this stuff uh, has, uh, we worked at the beginning with Laura Vampfeer, who I see is in the audience, and put a lot of this in place where we were able to do transactional integration with the medical record system. Um, and we were able to basically hack the current systems in place to shove this data in. And then there's, of course, a workflow, because physicians don't necessarily know, you know what the new tests are, so you actually want to put this in their workflow so that it makes it seamless and easy. Um, final two things to finish up on. So network of data. Um, I inserted my little uh, poke at the bottom here. Um, so this isn't a software problem anymore, as the previous speaker pointed out. We have structured data, we have semantic query engines, we have the ability to federate across institutions. In fact, we're already doing that at uh, Stanford, Intermountain, and three other institutions that are all federating data. It's a policy issue, it's an organizational issue, it's a political issue. So, you know, when, when UCSF and Stanford will share their cancer patients' information with each other, you know, de identified subsets, then the world will be a better place. Um, so, what's next? So, we are in this horrendous world right now where there really aren't any standards for any of this information. There are really no standards for genomics information. There are absolutely no standards for clinical information and how to structure it. And at UCSF, we've taken at least a first crack at this. So when we're thinking about this from the policy perspective, can we think about how to take this first crack and maybe publish it as something for people to react to? Maybe it doesn't become the standard, maybe it becomes one bit of the conversation. Or do we have to go the other way where we have to work in a top-down fashion and start mandating? Given the position that many medical uh, institutions are in where they're held hostage by their EMR company, maybe we do have to start with legislation and mandate. So I don't know what the answer is, but we have to find out. So thank you so much. to uh, welcome you to the meeting. It sounds like an exciting meeting, and I'm really sorry that I can't be there, but uh, meetings here uh, at the White House demanded my attention. Uh, but I'm glad to be able to join you at least for a few minutes and talk about the President's initiative on precision medicine. So on January 30th this year, the President announced the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is intended to change the face of American medicine. And we hope to do that in uh, steps that are reasonable and manageable and feasible, uh, but in the long run have a, a long-term plan to uh, have a very disruptive effect on uh, medical care uh, and treatment, as well as research um, and, and, and health. So the initiative, uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative that was proposed in the FY16 budget has a piece on cancer genomics, another on building a national cohort for precision medicine, another on reimbursement strategies, and the last one is regulation. And so I'll just say a few words about each of those. So the first
first piece is $70 million for uh, genomics in cancer. And of course, this is a very established field, very mature field. Uh, this is where I think we can make the most progress most quickly because there's so much evidence uh, for different cancers being mediated by particular mutations and certain treatments being uh, useful and appropriate for people with particular uh, genotypes and tumors with particular genotypes. So I think the cancer genomic field is where we can uh, make large strides quickly to demonstrate the power of precision medicine. The second part is uh, $200 million, I'm sorry, uh, $130 million uh, for NIH to build uh, a national cohort. And we don't yet know what that group is going to look like. There will be an advisory committee appointed from the outside, from uh, people who are experts in uh, various aspects of precision medicine, from genomics to building cohorts for other purposes, uh, to privacy experts and regulatory uh, experts. So it'll be a very diverse committee that will give the NIH uh, advice on how to build the most effective cohort that we can. And so that group is going to, uh, the, the advisory group is going to have an interesting challenge because as all of you well know, there are many cohorts across the country of various sizes uh, and, and textures and flavors. And they all have something unique to offer, but most of them can't speak to each other, and I mean that electronically. So most cohorts uh, have at least genomic data and EHR, or electronic health record data, and try to integrate those. But this cohort is intended to be much deeper than, than that. Uh, the goal of the cohort is to begin to integrate many kinds of data, including epigenomics and metagenomics uh, and uh, many characteristics that are at a phenotypic level as well as lifestyle and behavior level. And so some of it will be uh, information such as diet and exercise, other information that could be uh, integrated into these models could be mobile device information and tracking, tra personal trackers. And so it's intended to be a very complex, uh, but hopefully reasonably comprehensive data set on each patient. And probably no single cohort across the country already has uh, exactly the constellation of, of um, measurements that we're hoping for here. But that will be the job of this, uh, this advisory committee, is to figure out what cohorts already exist, what they measure, how many patients are in them, and then how we can interface with them. And so the challenge will be how many of uh, the goal of a million people are new, uh, recruited specifically for this precision medicine uh, activity, versus how many are already in cohorts. So the cohorts that already exist, we think that the biggest challenge will be interoperability of EHRs. And that's something we're working on very hard. And if People out there have ideas of what we could do to make uh, the electronic health records more interoperable between systems. Uh, we would be very grateful for your ideas. We really need to think outside the box on this because we find that to be one of the major barriers at uh, an infrastructure level, that if we're using uh, cohorts from different places, different groups, different software, uh, there's going to be an interesting challenge of integrating the data and really taking advantage of the high numbers of patients that are beginning to be uh, integrated into precision medicine cohorts. So we see those as some of the big uh, challenges. Uh, another that I think is more easily solved is uh, how to uh, uh, ensure that the cohort is representative of the people of the United States. So for example, the VA has a, a cohort called the Million Veterans Project, and that would be in many ways a very diverse group, but you can imagine it would have a certain skew in terms of gender and uh, possibly age. Uh, so that wouldn't be by itself representative of the American public. So one possibility is to use a new cohort to, uh, we might say, fill in the gaps look at the cohorts that we will uh, attempt to use, and then NIH would build a new cohort that would balance uh, the demographics of the overall cohort uh, once we've integrated the, the different cohorts together. 
The third piece of this is $5 million for CMS to look at reimbursement strategies. So this is through Medicare and Medicaid, where reimbursement uh, is largely based on volume of practice, uh, volume of seeing patients, volume of tests, uh, volume of all kinds of medical care. And we think, uh, and, and the Department of uh, Health and Human Services is quite passionate about this, that reimbursement should be on value, not volume. And so the Director of uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Secretary Burwell, who was out in uh, your neck of the woods about a week ago and uh, apparently had a wonderful visit, by the way, uh, is very committed to getting uh, more and more uh, of the uh, of the reimbursement strategies based on value and not volume. And so her goal is that 20% of all reimbursement will be based on value uh, by 2016, and 50% will be uh, based on value by 2018, which I think is a very aggressive and exciting uh, schedule that will change both, uh, not, not just uh, Medicare and Medicaid, but presumably uh, private insurance as well. And then the final area is uh, $10 million for FDA to look at the regulations that will affect the delivery of precision medicine. And we know that there are many technologies today that are regulated by um, regulations that may not apply very appropriately to those technologies. So one of the distinctions that FDA has a hard time making under current rules is between uh, devices that might have very dangerous effects, like, such as, for example, a stent, uh, versus devices that might just not work at their worst but wouldn't cause damage, and that might be, for example, a hearing aid. Uh, and so we're hoping that there will be a, a breakdown of some sort of technology um, to accommodate the greater uh, diversity of technology that we have today uh, than we had when any of the regulations were written. FDA is very committed to taking a fresh look at their diagnostic tests uh, and, and their, their registration of tests, their registration of drugs. They had a marvelous meeting in February looking at entirely new ways uh, of regulating next generation sequencing. And I think that will be a very productive process uh, of review uh, what the technology is that will be introduced with or most important for precision medicine and how we can change regulations to make that technology more accessible <clears throat> without risking uh, safety for the public. So the, we think that the, uh, the core that we've proposed in the FY16 budget will give us the platform to build uh, precision medicine nationally. And the role of the, the federal government in uh, precision medicine is clearly to fill the gaps where uh, the private industry probably won't go, uh, making things that would be good for the whole but might not be uh, important enough to any individual company to invest in, and particularly the interoperability and the infrastructure to bring together many kinds of data seems like a pretty appropriate activity for the federal government. So we're very excited about launching uh, this initiative, and we're uh, hoping that NIH will be uh, announcing their advisory committee soon. There will be a number of workshops coming up. There already have been some on various aspects of precision medicine, and we'll be soliciting ideas and suggestions from the public and the scientific community. Uh, well, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, kind of launch this event, and I second uh, Keith's comment that uh, this is a kind of unusual time. I'm a basic scientist, spent my life in the laboratory, but um, from time to time, the interaction with the policy community uh, becomes critical. There have really been two times in my career. I uh, actually did my first DNA sequencing up at Parnassus in 1977 under the watchful eye of Howard Goodman himself. And I uh, have been sequencing DNA ever since. But, 
have seen genomics uh, go through some pretty astonishing phases. Uh, so today, in my brief remarks, I really want to emphasize the need for a, what I'm calling a 21st century approach to the challenges, opportunities that uh, we face. And if there's to be a take-home lesson from my brief remarks, it's that uh, we, uh, we really need to modernize several aspects of the way that research is done on the interface between basic science, medicine, and just society, where the, where the patients, uh, those are the patients. Uh, I got my policy start with a kind of another UCSF connection. Uh, in uh, 1988, Bruce Alberts uh, cha chaired the uh, NRC committee that uh, sort of outlined a framework uh, for carrying out the Human Genome Project. And, Really, that sort of modest rhetoric is sort of indicated by this uh, quotation, acquiring a map, sequence, and so forth will greatly enhance progress in human biology and medicine. Uh, this was before that era of sort of more massive hype associated with genomics. But uh, the uh, changes between 1988 and 2011 uh, have been astonishing. And, and I chose from the Precision Medicine report uh, of many possible quotations, one that, uh, that focuses actually more on obstacles than it does on the opportunity. There is a lot in this report about the opportunities. I actually think the opportunities are rather obvious. Uh, it's how to go about them uh, that I think we're here to discuss today. And, uh, the, the, the basic notion uh, that the efficiency with which we can learn things today, both on the basic science side and in medicine, uh, are really outpacing uh, the way that we're going about attempting to do this. And it's going to take our collective ingenuity to, uh, to bring this back into balance. I won't go over all of the sort of key recommendations of the Precision Medicine Report. I, I think my, my uh, sort of role here is essentially to put this uh, meeting in historical context. Uh, it's a sure sign that I'm getting old. The, uh, I, I, I'm the only person who served both on the Alberts Committee and the uh, Hellman uh, Committee. And uh, we have uh, a, n a number of different aspects of this uh, qu question to look at, but I really want to focus on the last. I have only a couple of minutes. And, uh, at the core of the Precision Medicine re Report is this notion uh, that the good things that uh, we envision happening uh, over a substantial period as we sort of direct more of biomedical research resources into this direction are going to be absolutely dependent on some kind of information commons. And I'd say at least half of the report attempts to outline uh, what the nature of this information commons is. And I think any fair-minded reading of what the committee tried to say there uh, indicates it's just not something that we have now, or even that we know in detail how to build. Uh, but it's clear that it can be done, and uh, that's our challenge. Uh, so uh, this was uh, one of the sort of centerpiece figures in the report, and at its uh, core, we have this rather Google Maps-like view that uh, just like latitude and longitude by themselves uh, tell us relatively little, uh, but they're powerful organizing principles. And really the, the, the question uh, is what's the organizing principle uh, for knowledge? at the basic science kind of clinical interface. And I think the answer to that is absolutely obvious and is circled at the bottom. It's patience. That is, we need to organize this information commons where the sort of unit uh, that uh, is the kind of essential identifier of a record, uh, which contains an enormous amount of highly diverse information, is going to be the individual patient. And it's really that patient-centeredness that just isn't there in the way that we currently handle genomic data, at least collectively. Obviously, some researchers uh, think this way and operate this way locally, uh, but I cannot go today and find one single individual in the world 
uh, where I can pull together around that individual uh, anything like uh, the aggregate of, of uh, basic science and medical information which exists about that person, uh, even if the person waives all kind of uh, privacy concerns about the handling of those data. So that shows how far we have to go because the, the numbers of patients that will be required to, to really bring this vision to fruition are going to be large. Uh, they're going to be on the order of millions rather than hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. Uh, they may ultimately include a substantial portion of the population. And so my take home theme uh, is that business as usual will not get us there. One thing I learned in the Human Genome Wars, believe it or not, the Alberts Committee recommendations were controversial in their day, uh, particularly in the basic science community, uh, where this idea, this big science, sort of top down, so forth, was uh, viewed as a threat. Uh, one thing I learned uh, is that there are two arguments that you encounter at these historical junctures. Uh, juxtaposed often from the same uh, disputant and intermixed with one another. One is that what you're trying to do is impossible. And there are a long list of reasons uh, why. And the other argument is we're already doing it. We don't need any kind of a special initiative. And I've heard both of these arguments about the precision medicine, this patient-oriented information commons, many reasons why it can't be done. Uh, and then many examples about how it is in fact already being done. So both of these arguments are simply wrong, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy uh, to find a path. Uh, I don't have time to give uh, sort of my favorite take on how to do this, but I would call your attention to a, a paper that I co-authored with a number of other people uh, just last fall on redefining genomic privacy, trust and empowerment. And uh, this essay, which came out of a Banbury meeting at the kind of Cold Spring Harbor, uh, is, a, is, is one very sketchy vision of uh, a, a participant-centered kind of research scheme. The system we have right now is not only not patient-centered, it's just not participant-centered. At the, at the key moment in the way that we bring data into the system that we now analyze, it's kind of like a closing on a real estate deal. Uh, we have uh, some powerful parties at the table, uh, typically a federal funding agency, uh, a major institution like UCSF, uh, often a powerful investigator. Sitting somewhere nervously on the side uh, is a patient who the other parties hope will sign a long, complicated, legalistic document uh, and then kind of get out of their way. That is not an unfair description of the way we do business today. This system needs to be blown up. The patient needs to be put in the middle of it. Uh, and then we need to build out from there in some trust-based system. And uh, there's issues of transparency about control. The control has to be in the hands of the patient or this isn't going to happen. Uh, and uh, there has to be a level of reciprocity in these relationships that does not now exist. And the, the IT revolution, which is clearly the kind of partner, it was the partner of the Human Genome Project and it's the partner of the Precision Medicine uh, Initiative, uh, you know, offers tools that complicated as this may seem, it is no more complicated than lots of things that are being done, particularly in the private sector today, with vast amounts of information, highly personalized, tailored, and so forth. So that's our, uh, that's our goal. And uh, I'd like to strongly uh, endorse, this is a, a little uh, policy piece that Sue, Sue Desmond Hellman, the former chancellor here, uh, uh, wrote uh, a couple of years ago, and the, and the key point is that we're, we're talking about a kind of a new social contract. It's just a different way of thinking about how people interact with the healthcare system and, and a uh, more closely uh, kind of uh, aligned basic research system uh, to move this forward. So my bottom line is that uh, business as usual is not what we're talking about. I don't think we know in detail what we're talking about, uh, but we can get there. 
And that's the goal. So thank you for inviting me. And um, I think uh, somebody like Atul represents thinking about millions of people at a time. And I'm maybe at the opposite end of the spectrum because I think about um, rare disorders. And I just want to tell you just a couple of sentences about a class of very rare disorders. But they're important because these are pioneer conditions that have way uh, more importance to medicine than their sheer uh, numbers. So human severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID, has really been a pioneer disease in many ways. Di uh, first recognized only in the 1950s, very recently, as a Swiss type of a gamma globulinemia. This made it possible for people like Walter Hitzig and Robert Good to be able to distinguish the, between the kinds of lymphocytes in our immune system that make antibodies, that are B cells, and fight certain classes of infections versus T cells that fight viruses or anti-tumor and so on. So that it's the human patient disease that led to this uh, fundamental insight. And uh, then SCID was the first human condition to be cured by transplantation, except for kidney transplants from one uh, twin to another. Uh, so this was uh, a skid infant in 1968, cured with a transplant from his sister. He's now um, a successful accountant in Connecticut, paying taxes, and has his own three kids. So this is uh, showing the whole medical field that transplantation is possible. And, and why did it start with SCID? Because these are people who are born like the boy in the bubble with no immune system. So they can't resist an incoming graft. So it, it's an easy proving ground for new treatments like uh, transplant. And during the 70s, uh, for the next 30 years, it was SCID where new developments in transplantation occurred. You don't have to have an HLA identical sibling anymore in order to be a transplant recipient. And in fact, we now have uh, unrelated donor registries with over 20 million people who volunteered to say, if somebody has my uh, tissue type and needs a transplant, call me and I will uh, volunteer. So, um, and, and uh, less um, than perfectly related people are very good donors now based on the uh, work that has largely been done in SCID, even though leukemia transplants are more than 20 times more common than SCID. Uh, this was also, SCID was uh, in the um, genotype due to ADA deficiency, the first condition where enzyme replacement treatment uh, was developed as a human therapy. SCID, as you probably know, was the first human disease cured by gene therapy. And you probably also know that complications of that included leukemia from the uh, retroviral insertional mutagenesis that happened. And uh, so this needs to be worked on, obviously, and, and uh, safety and further work has to be done. But again, this is a pioneer disease. And at the present, um, SCID is giving us all kinds of new things. Uh, JAK inhibitors used to treat rheumatoid arthritis are a direct development of JAK3 deficient SCID. And uh, transplantation um, is improving with biologics to open up the bone marrow niches where the uh, stem cells have to live. And there are many other exciting developments uh, that can come along from research and be applied right to the clinic through uh, rare diseases like SCID. And we know that there are many different uh, uh, SCID genes that we know and additional ones that we don't know. And these are very hard to diagnose. The, uh, they occur very early in life. And unless you have a positive family history, which is present in only about 10 to 20% of the time, um, 
these babies look perfectly healthy when they're born. And so that has led to the idea, uh, could we do something to screen the population the way we do for PKU to look for skid? And sure enough, there is a biomarker called uh, T-cell receptor excision circles, or TREX, um, in the thymus when you are developing the great diversity of lymphocytes that you're going to need to fight all the pathogens you'll find in your life. Um, uh, different sections of the T cell receptor genes undergo recombination. And what do you think happens to the DNA leftovers after that combination? You think maybe they just get degraded. But no, they get turned into circles by the same enzymes that are putting the linear gene together. And these circles are very stable, and you can do a PCR reaction across the joint of the circle, which shows you that T cell development is happening the way it should. So this has turned into a newborn screening test where we take the dried blood spot heel stick filter cards that every baby gets in the nursery. We extract DNA from a little punch and do a PCR reaction across the joint of that circle. And if we find plenty of copies of the TREX, this is TREX and this is an actin control, then those babies are fine. Every once in a while, there's a circle that's a dud, and we have to go back and get another one. But if we have babies with skid, their TREX are undetectable, even though actin is there. So this has turned into a very valuable way to find these rare babies soon enough to do the most effective treatment. And starting in a couple of states, including California, which has been a real leader in newborn screening, um, these are the states now screening for TREX, and we're pressuring those other ones. You know, some are planning to start, some are planning to plan, um, but they'll all do it uh, s sooner or later. <laughs> okay. um, so, and w in the course of this, we've had to change the definition of skid, which I. Uh, sort of overlooked in the beginning, saying boy in the bubble, but um, these kids used to die of infections. They would have weight loss, diarrhea, terrible opportunistic infections early in life. Um, uh, now we don't have that happen. We get them when they're healthy. You can't see anything wrong by looking. You have to um, do the laboratory testing that establishes the diagnosis. And meanwhile, we've been able to measure the unbiased incidence in the population and find this is twice as, as common as we used to think. Because it used to be that only parents with the resources to go from doctor to doctor in time got their kid treated. Another thing we found is that not all skid presents in babies. So there's leaky skid. Uh, and this kid was uh, our age six, but he'd been sick during his life. And now we're realizing every skid gene, like this recombinase activating gene, or RAG1, um, has an allelic series. And here are um, representations of that from wild type to a very, very debilitated uh, genotype. And these are um, my post-lunch pointillist to a very abstract representations of the diversity of the uh, repertoire of lymphocytes. So if you have normal recombination, you've got a gazillion different combinations. And uh, with decreasing activity, you have less and less complexity. You can't make the, the diverse repertoire you need. And you get infections maybe later in life. You also get immune dysregulation. So we've now understood that you need immune cells to regulate each other. And if you don't have that diversity, you get autoimmune disease too. And finally, we've learned from this, this is what we used to think were the incidences of the different types of skid, with half of them being X-linked. But now that we do TREK screening, we've learned that that's actually a quarter of the cases. And there are many more unknown ones uh, than we thought before. So this gives us an opportunity to do exome sequencing and use genomics to try to look for the causes of, of skid in these people. Um, 
and, and uh, we're enrolling these and studying them, doing informatics with uh, Steve Brenner at Berkeley and others. And uh, so the, the idea here is that we can diagnose and treat individuals with serious illness. We can find them early. We can learn the incidence and spectrum of these diseases that we didn't know before, find new disease genes and mechanisms, um, and use this knowledge to develop new drugs and treatments and improve public health. And I want to say screening is all about fairness. You get screening. You don't have to be rich. Everybody gets it. So I want to say thank you and uh, uh, think about the rare cases. OK. So what I thought I would do today is discuss the president's precision medicine initiative, uh, of which FDA has a, uh, a role. We have a specific plan to, uh, to address um, how we are going to deal with genomics uh, in the future, uh, how we are going to uh, regulate that and what the, the uh, sort of our framework is for thinking about this. this. Um, so to start off, I just want to point out, and, and to an academic audience in particular, my point of view may seem, you know, I'm going to be giving a very FDA-centric point of view to all this. But here, I just wrote, in, in my view, what really are some of the differences between what I would call traditional diagnostics, and I, I don't like to use that word, I just don't know of a better word, uh, versus, you know, the ones that my office is typically seen and reviewed versus what we are in, we see uh, with precision, precision medicine. So one of the big differences are the technologies uh, that we're seeing. So if you think about immunohistochemistry, um, you know, and other types of, or PCR, uh, certain types of PCR, these are what I would call lower medium resolution technology. You know, you're getting very large bins of people, but now with Omics or uh, high resolution technology, we're now able to, to really subdivide people into very tiny groups. And this has important implications for us as we look at how we're going to review uh, uh, diagnostics that are related to uh, uh, precision medicine. Um, Typically, when we see a diagnostic come in, it's detecting one analyte or a certain set of analytes. Each variant in a DNA could be an analyte, so some, some sorts of PCR-based genetic tests will have a very well-defined number of analytes. But of course, when you're, say, running a whole genome sequence, you can't define the size of the variation you're going to see. You may find millions of variants that you'll have to sift through. Um, and of course, those could just be SNPs. You'll have structural variation, CNVs, and so on. So our traditional sort of way of thinking about it, this is one test, one disease. We get a test in. It's going to diagnose this disease or that disease. But of course, with genomics, it's really one test, many, most diseases. Um, it, you know, you, you often don't know what you are going to end up diagnosing when you run, say, a whole genome test. And in fact, this is sort of the problem with incidental findings, that even if you set out to diagnose one disease, you may end up diagnosing a bunch of other things as well. Risk, other diseases, uh, you may figure out they don't have, the person doesn't have the parents they thought they had. You know, it's, uh, you can unlock a real Pandora's box, and they're actually downstream effects of this. Once you test somebody, say, for a hereditary disease, are you now going to test the family members? What if they don't want to be tested? That might be part of the procedure you use to diagnose. And finally, and so from the point of view of, you know, translating research into, uh, uh, you know, products that will aid patients, you know, typically, FDA, we want to see that a test is clinical, clinically valid, that it, it um, um, you know, whatever it's detecting has a very well-defined 
uh, you know, it has some sort of clinical significance that we can understand, and that might be evidence we get from previous research. You know, obviously the best, we do, usually don't require randomized control trials, but of course that is the gold standard. But now we're really talking about getting clinical evidence from medical practice in one form or, or another. Um, and this is this concept that, you know, I've heard, you know, at the IOM as well, of a learning health system, that you're gonna take people's experiences as patients and then translate, do research on those experiences and translating, translate that back. So we're really seeing almost a merging of research and practice, and this is, has important regulatory implications, but I think it's important for everybody to think about what that means. I mean, I come from a basic science background. I was not trained to think about my research as affecting patients or somehow utilizing something that was from clinical practice. So just to illustrate the issue here from that last point, we have basically two separate regulatory systems for in vitro diagnostics at FDA. One is the pre-market submission. If you want to sell a test and make claims about it, we have a certain risk-based framework to look at it, and I won't go into the details, but basically the regulations are built around what you're gonna do with that test in clinical care when you see a patient, when a patient is seen and they need a diagnostic result. We also have clinical, we also have the, so those are the 510Ks and the PMAs, if you've heard of those. The investigational device exemption regulation deal with essentially clinical trials or human subjects research, where now you're going to use a device for research, a test for research, and now we're interested in what the risk is there. And so these actually end up having different sort of decision making, different requirements, um, and different regulatory implications. So now we're in this fuzzy area where you know, the same test sort of being used for research at the same time it's being used for clinical practice. Now, right now, although this will change, right now we're sort of, everybody's focused on next generation sequencing, but we can see pr the proteome and the microbiome and these other ohms coming down the pathway. And I think it's important to think about not just what we can do today, but how we're going to accommodate all the future change. Um, and I've gone through most of these special issues with next generation sequencing that actually we've discussed at FDA for a number of years. Uh, um, the one thing that I didn't really get, this is, at, is, this is rapidly evolving technology, and that when it gets down to physicians and patients, they often have a harder time, hard time understanding what to do with this information. And I think one of the things to remember at a place like UCSF is this, you know, most academic institutions are pretty rarefied environments, and most clinical, like in oncology, most clinical, most patients are not in a clinical trial. They're not necessarily being in an academic medical center. We have to think about the big scope of how we're going to address all of them. So the Precision Medicine Initiative. So you've heard about NIH and the cohorts. They're the big gorilla to us in this. We're a tiny little player, budget-wise and other. But so this is our FDA-centric view, uh, our FDA-centric uh, uh, map of the Precision Medicine Initiative. But basically, we were tasked by the president to come up with a new approach for evaluating next generation sequencing tests to enable innovation while at the same time making sure that the tests that are used on patients are safe for them, safe and effective. So this is sort of the virtuous cycle that we imagine coming out of the PMI that you know we ensure the tests are safe by, through regulation, those tests go into the clinic where they're used on patients. But now in the regime we're talking about, those patients are generating the data that are used for research. And then that research in turn, for FDA at least, will inform our, we can act as regulatory science. It's gonna inform how we approach things in the future. We will not have a static view. We are gonna change with the science as we have, we, we, we do, quite frequently, actually. So I do want to address why now. Um, the, you know, we've, first of all, we've had some experience with NGS platforms, the, particularly the Illumina clearances. We had to come up with some new approaches to deal with some of the special things about NGS. 
and we feel like we can build on it now. But also, I would say there are a number of efforts in the community to create standards. There's now a better understanding of the technology and how to use that. Um, there are a lot of efforts, and this uh, really is not just from the political side, but from the technical side and the organization of the community. This really is the sweet spot, you know? And so things that we talked about a couple of years ago, at least internally, and said, wouldn't it be nice? Now all of a sudden we find it's actually possible to think about doing these things. So our goals, I'm just gonna be very high level here, but our goals for regulatory oversight of NGS are to, you know, multi-fold. We want regulatory efficiency because that is going to enable innovation. Um, but we want to protect patients, it's our mandate to protect patients at the same time. Um, we want any regulatory system to take into account the realities of the technology and how that technology is used in practice. And we want to, ent again, anticipate future developments. Um, just very quickly, this is a busy slide, but um, we've come up with a number of features we think such a regulatory regime should encounter. You know, because these tests are changing so quickly, we want to, have multi we want to be able to accommodate modifications and multiple test configurations. We want to enable improvements easily. We want to take advantage of what's happening in the community in terms of this sort of learning health system concept and you know, the databases that are out there to inform our regulation, to determine clinical validity, particularly with the rare variant problem where we'll never be able to require a formal statistically uh, you know, a seamless study. It's going to be really gradual accrual of evidence and what do you do with the patients who need something now? We want that evidence to be available to them in a way they can understand. And we obviously we want to maintain FDA controls to assure that these tests have uh, uh, good analytical and clinical performance. So we've broken this down in our concept into two parts. So to ensure that the tests are giving analytically the correct results, that when you call a variant, you know that is a correct variant, and that is, can still, is still an issue. Um, our idea is to move from one side of the area, the pre-market review of every individual test, to taking a more standards-based approach, um, where we can work with the community to create standards, not just any standards, but standards that would be of a, what we would call regulatory grade, good enough for a FDA. And once those standards are in place, then people who are running next-gen tests could just certify by some oversight mechanism conformance to those standards, as opposed to requiring an application for all the possible intended uses that a next-gen test may have. So this is um, something that's really going to require involvement of the community. And we see a lot of these efforts already, Global Alliance um, and other things. We want to continue to build on, we want to build on those um, to create very robust standards that we can, uh, you know, implement for regulatory purposes. And then on the clinical performance side, we're really looking at using databases. We've done this with um, the cystic fibrosis tests on the Illumina platforms that we uh, approved. We um, uh, look, used a database. And so now we want to, really the key thing here is what are the, you know, for regulatory grade, what is, the, uh, what about a database would be of sufficient quality for FDA. And so we're really looking at what the best practices ought to be. And so just to, I see my time is up. So just to finalize, I wanna say, we've obtained public input. We had a workshop on February 20th. We've received a number of comments. We're going through those. And we've developed an initial plan that involves standards development with the community. We're starting to put together groups to do that. Um, uh, computational solutions that we can develop that will be open source that will help developers um, of these tests. And also we are starting to work with NIH to develop regulatory processes for using their curated databases such as ClinVar. Um, and um, so at, at that I think I will stop. I've listed a number of important issues here. I think they're the same issues we all 
have identified. So uh, one thing I would add is just we need transparency so we can understand the provenance of the data that's coming out of treatment, um, who's been tested with what test and how well those tests work. And that's something I think from an EHR site we will need as well. All right, so, sorry for going over, thank you. <laughs>